Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to this program at the American Writers Museum. My name is Allison Sansoni. I'm the program director here. I'd like to welcome everyone joining us online as well. I know we have a, quite a few of you, so we'll give you a few moments to settle into your rooms and get settled as well. Thank you everyone for joining us here. I wanna give a quick shout out to our book selling partner, Seminary Co-op in the back who you can visit if you don't yet have a copy of tonight's book, The End of Reality. Those of you watching on, uh, along at home can order one from seminarycoop.com through the link that we'll post in our chat. And if you have questions for tonight's panelists, please save them to the end of the discussion. Online, you can post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many of those as we can, but we apologize if we're not able to get to yours. Thank you all for being here online and in person and supporting the past, present, and future of American writing. We're here tonight to talk about the influence of technology on writing. In Jonathan Taplin's new book, The End of Reality, he describes a dystopian future in which billionaires sell us their versions of our lives. Michi Trota's organizing work in science fiction and fandom spaces has brought her into contact with the effects of technological advances on creative labor and the fight to prioritize artists and their work over corporate greed. Jonathan is a public intellectual writer, film producer, and scholar. He's director emeritus of the Annenberg Innovation Lab at the University of Southern California and was a professor at the USC Annenberg School in the field of international communication and digital media entertainment until 2017. Since his graduation from Princeton University in 1969, his extraordinary journey has put him on, at the crest of every major cultural wave in the past half century. He was tour manager for Bob Dylan and the band, producer of major films such as Martin Scorsese's Mean Streets, and executive at Merrill Lynch, creator of the internet's first video on demand service and a cultural critic and author writing about technology in the new millennium. Michi is a five time Hugo award winning Filipino American writer, editor and narrative expert. Her work explores empowerment, representation, storytelling, autonomy, and how to exercise those tools for collective liberation and to dismantle oppressive institutions, not just survive them. Her publications include the Wing Luke Museum 2018-2019 exhibit Worlds Beyond Here, expanding the, universe of, expanding the universe of APA science fiction and Chicago Magazine, and she's been featured in The Guardian, Chicago Tribune, and CNN Philippines. Please join me in welcoming them, along with a third panelist, an AI chatbot, to the American Writers Museum. Thank you all for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah. I wanted to start tonight by setting some expectations um, and direct a question at, at both of you. What, or all three of you, what are we talking about when we talk about AI specifically in the context of creative writing? Well, for me, it is best summed up by what just happened in Hollywood. So there was a strike by the Writers Guild, and the core issue of the strike was that the studios wanted to take, let's say Marvel, every screenplay that they owned and put it into a large learning model that is a generative AI. And then instead of you know, hiring a high-class screenwriter to write the next Marvel movie, they would have a person who would be called a prompt writer, and he would write essentially four paragraphs. This is act one, the Hulk meets, you know, Captain America in Iceland, act two, Black Widow comes in and saves the day, you know, some simple four paragraphs. And in three hours, the chat GPT-like thing would turn out a first draft screenplay. Now it would be probably pretty banal and pretty bad. And it also couldn't be copyrighted because the copyright office says a machine 
written thing cannot get a copyright. So then they'd give it to some poor out of work screenwriter. We just saw a little quote over there with Louis B. Mary used to call screenwriters schmucks with Underwoods. Uh, right? so, uh, anyway, and, and he'd put his name on it and play with it. And that would be how Marvel could get a screenplay in four weeks instead of nine months. You know, so that's the practical application of how this, needless to say, would threaten all screenwriters, would threaten all creators in that industry, and and reduce their income by ninety percent. Yeah, and I think it's uh, important to note that even though these programs are called artificial intelligence. There is nothing intelligent about them. They're predictive programs. Um, the science fiction writer Ted Chang uh, called them applied statistics. Uh, there was a quote that I forgot who he attributed it to, but the idea was like, oh, what is artificial intelligence? The answer is, is that it was a poor choice of words in 1958. So it doesn't actually Artificial intelligence doesn't actually describe what these programs are and what they're doing. They basically create material based on a set of data that it's told, that the programs are told to pull from, whether that's information that you have online, your Facebook profile. I mean, we interact with these predictive programs all the time, from targeted ads to uh, the spell check that we use to autofill. These programs are already there, but the term applied statistics or predictive programming isn't as sexy or as catchy to the imagination as artificial intelligence. So the language choices that are being specifically made in selling the concept of these programs to the public is also something that we need to pay attention to. Yeah, I just want to say one other thing. We're here at a writer's museum, and obviously, I think this will affect writers. I'm on the board of the Authors Guild, and so three weeks ago, we sued OpenAI on behalf of all authors because AI, OpenAI, ChatGPT, trained itself on over 20,000 books you know, Stephen King novels, nonfiction work, all that, without their permission. And that's how you can say to ChatGPT, write me a Stephen King-like short story, and it will do it, because it knows what Stephen King is, knows how he writes, and it will just do it. And so this is a problem, but this eventually will be a problem for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because if you let's say you're a writer in an ad agency, according to Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, you won't have a job in 10 years. He said that the marginal cost of intelligence will drop to zero because of AI in the next 10 years, which would mean millions of people being put out of work and could only be remedied, he said, by universal basic intelligence, of a universal basic income. In other words, the government paying everyone to stay home in their pajamas and, uh, you know, play video games. I want to ask a little bit about language here, because we, we were just chatting about, you know, the way that we talk about this is important. So, you know, we talk about the rise of AI, we talk about the, this happening. And Jonathan, I think your book is pretty explicit about this not being a, you know, this isn't a weather system. So the, you know, it didn't just right. blow in. So how did we get here? Well, we got here because there are a small group of billionaire tech moguls who have, from the very beginning of the internet era, used the work of artists to track people to their system. How did YouTube get started? 
Well, you could put any movie clip, any song on YouTube, would do all sorts of stuff without paying any money. And people would go there to see those clips, right? And so this has been an exploitation regime. And it's really only four or five companies, you know, it's Google, it's Meta, it's Amazon, it's Microsoft, because Microsoft now controls ChatGPT and OpenAI. And they have the computing power because one of the things you realize as you study this is it requires a gigantic amount of computing power. And so the big will only get bigger and they will only get more power. Well, I mean, I think it's also, uh, it's these four companies are the, you know, they are the biggest examples, but they are also a, almost an inevitable outcome of the fact that the culture and the economy that they have grown in is one that is based on extraction and on exploitation in the pursuit of profit and limitless growth. Um, anybody who has studied basic scientific principles knows that you cannot have limitless growth. Um, that is why we have creatures on this planet that can only grow so big because after a while there's not enough oxygen to sustain them. And it's the same thing with growth. Uh, if you want to have continuous growth, it's going to come at the expense of something else. And what that comes usually comes from, or the expense, uh, the payment for that is made by people, particular people who are, who occupy less powerful uh, stations in society. Uh, we see this in capitalism and colonialism, the idea that everything around us, whether it's people, the land, uh, our technology is meant to be used and to be used up regardless of the ramifications down the line. Um, and I think one of the other things when we talk about language, specifically the language they're using around AI is meant to kind you know meant to give people the impression that these programs are thinking that they are feeling when we, they talk about these programs learn these uh, we are teaching these programs we're teaching a bot how to think that language is humanizing and it's meant to lower our defenses in a way around what we expect that interaction with these programs to be like, which is in a lot of ways, we have been sort of conditioned to expect this from AI, not just from the language that they're using to market it, but from the stories that we have consumed about artificial intelligence, about robots, um, about also what happens when people, when there is the perception of competition between right now it's the perception of competition between AI, these predictive programs and workers. And as we are talking about specifically tonight, writers and creative workers. And, and by the way, resistance is possible. I mean, the, the, the striking workers in Hollywood, the actors decided they didn't want the studios to be able to essentially scan their body into a database and then be able to reuse that body without their permission forever. That was the key final sticking point of this Screen Actors Guild strike. Just the way the authors didn't want to have them scan their screenplays and remake their screenplays. So, you know, collective action can lead to resistance. Uh, the collective action of the Authors Guild of the Stephen Kings of the world saying, no, you can't do this. The collective action of the 10,000 photographers represented by Getty Images who said to stable diffusion, you cannot steal 12 million images from Getty Images, use it to train your generative AI, stable diffusion, and not pay us any money. You can't do that. And so that's, I mean, to me, these are solvable problems. Transparency, compensation, 
you know, those are things we can we can deal with in in legislation and in regulation. Is that what is the pushback? What makes this moment different from technological advancements in the past? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'll let me you talk, but I, I I think we didn't push back against social media, right? We just accepted it, and and then all of a sudden we see the teen suicide rate go up through the ceiling. And we say, hmm, what happened? Well, they put the like button on Facebook and the next year, teen suicides started to go through the roof. Well, is there some connection here? Yes. I mean, there is some connection, but um, I think if we were talking about technological movements, I keep thinking a lot about the Luddites and the way that the Luddites have been painted in our current culture as just absolutely we want nothing to do with technology technology is bad which is not actually right. the actual story of the luddites they didn't have a problem with the technology what they had was a problem with the industrialists who were using that technology to justify uh exploitive working conditions poor pay uh to not you know not taking care of their workers and that is almost exactly the same thing that we're seeing. Um, social media is one of those things where I, I actually loved, I loved the idea of it. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, used to my, use myself as an example. If I had had social media around when my parents died, um, both my parents died when I was 12 and 14. And this was in 19, my dad died in 1992. I still could have remained connected to my fam my extended family in the Philippines much, much easier. Um, in 1992 was, if ever you remember how expensive long distance phone, phone calls, phone calls yes. how, uh, how undependable air <clears throat> mail was. Right. And that sort of social connection and that ease of access, I think has been something that's been really useful. But again, like we're pointing out it's not the technology that's the problem. It's the people making the decisions about how the technology is being implemented and what is driving their decisions. They are not being driven by the idea of social media as the example, as an public good, as a way to maintain connection, to, uh, to rebuild connection um, with family, with communities, um, of building a larger collective. I mean, we did, you know, if you remember the way back in the day, the Arab Spring and how vital social media was to that movement. I don't think it could take place today because we also have the example of the uh, Duterte administration in the Philippines having been enabled by social media, not because social media is bad, but because the people in charge of it decided to prioritize material that would gain more interaction, that would gain more clicks, which would mean more profit and more views, as opposed to one caring about, is this information accurate? Is this helpful? Is this a public good? So we're looking at the same thing, I think, when we are looking at pushback against um, these predictive programs, is that it's not just about, no, this tech is bad, it's that we don't want this tech to be used to further economic and social divisions and to promote more inequity and injustice. I think we've we've seen some early on some really clumsy applications of these types of predictive programs. You know, it, it, the result efforts to automate news stories that result in things that are biased or false. Um, you know, plagiarism scandals at academic institutions. Do these early failures mean that we don't need to be concerned? No, we need to be concerned. I mean, look, we're headed into an election in less than 12 months. My prediction is that there will be such a flood of fake media in the next 12 months that you will eventually just give up. You will, you will won't know, have no sense of what's true and what's not true. Um, 
every politician will be a victim of left or right of fake audio, fake video. And there is no way, you know, I was on the phone with Jaron Lanier, who's one of the brightest people in tech today. And, and I challenged him. I said, look, this is coming up in, in 12 months. There's no way you're going to put this genie back in the bottle in 12 months. And he basically said, probably not. There's nothing can be done. So we'll see what happens. And, and the problem is that it makes lots of mistakes. As you well know, chat GPT, when it doesn't know the answer to something, it just makes it up. The researchers call it hallucinations. You know, as if it, as, terms as, as if it yeah. was taking LSD and then <laughs> writing stuff. And, and so this is not, you know, very healthy, but that doesn't mean it isn't going to get better. It is going to get better and it will continue to improve to the level that I actually believe that Altman is right. That if you were a copywriter in an ad agency, your job is on the verge of disappearing, just as if you're a radiologist. The idea of reading x-rays by a human is not going to exist in five years. Uh, you know, the, the radiologist's job will be to carry the result from the AI and explain it to the patient, you know. And I don't necessarily think that the these programs ability to create text is necessarily it's not it's not necessarily a bad thing the idea of having a program that could take care of doing what we call filler text like this is just the what when and how of a news thing like this is this is breaking news this happened this many people were harmed or this is the immediate thing the story is breaking that's not something we necessarily need to rely or have a person expend bandwidth on doing. But um, I very much believe in uh, Ted Chang had said this about um, the idea of these programs being able to replicate language is that language without intention, emotion, and purpose that humans bring to it becomes meaningless. And I think that's, again, where the value of human interaction, the value of human creation, I think really can't be overlooked. I, mean, I would love it as a, you know, as a, both a writer and an editor to have a program that would uh, allow me to not have to worry about just the very boring, here, I just need to turn out a news brief of what happened this would arguably free up reporters and writers to really do the hard, deep, investigative, context-heavy um, perspective and narrative aware work that actually I think could be a panacea or at least a counterbalance to the proliferation of dis and misinformation that we are seeing. The press is supposed to be, and when it is a, in a healthy form, is supposed to be one of our bulwarks against misinformation, against poor information, against propaganda. And again, the problem stems from, it's not that there aren't journalists doing that work. There are so many, and so many who are putting their lives literally on the line in order to do so. But when the, when the people paying them, when the companies who own the publications are deciding to prioritize what is going to get them views, what is going to make them money, as opposed to what is a public service. That is where we're also, I think, coming up against a lot of the problems. I would like but, to just pose a few of these questions to the chat as we are, as we're talking. Sure. So um, we'll, be, we'll be asking, 
asking the chat if, if you want to look up here on the monitor for the answer as we're uh, as we're discussing, okay. just to provide a little bit of contrast and <laughs> what, an idea. What did the chat did the chat just reply to your last it question? It did. It said no, did I won't replace writers. While I can generate text and assist with various writing tasks, I lack the creativity, personal experience, and unique perspectives that make human authored content so valuable. Okay, but so, is it so me, what it let, wants let, you to let me, think? Let me just right? say that having been a professor at the University of Southern California for quite a few years, um, university administrators are putting all their money into what they call STEM. They do not want to support the humanities. So who's going to train these journalists? Yep. I mean, you know, the Annenberg School of Communications, probably one of the best journalism schools in the country, is starved for money because all the money is going into the engineering school. And I just read last week that the university, the Mississippi University system is not going to support with state money humanities anymore, full out. No money for English teachers, no money for journalism teachers. Because we're all making so much money already, science. right? <laughs> because they think that the University of Mississippi should be a trade school that trains people. Now, the problem with that is, for the last 10 years, I've heard people and parents tell me, well, if my son learns how to code, he'll be fixed for life. Well, guess what? ChatGPT can code better than most humans. So, I mean, that's not going to be a good solution either. No, it feels very much like, again, I'm pulling from science fiction. It's, this is Frankenstein's monster. Right. Uh, and really, if uh, Dr. Frankenstein had been forced to take a couple of hum humanities classes, maybe, maybe the idea of science, of unfettered, science for the sake of ego if he had been forced to ask himself bigger questions how about elon musk being forced to ask that Oof. i would have settled <laughs> yeah. in both of those cases for some parenting classes mm, uh yeah it is i this is actually something that i think writer writers i think are definitely talking about this not just the issue of misinformation but also the perspectives the pr particular perspectives that are going to become the expected norm and default for your writing to reflect if you are going to be considered hireable. And that is going to, and who is controlling that? Who is making the decision about how these programs determine, con if they even bother to determine context, if they are aware of bias? Because um, if we look at right now the majority of information available has been in you know the united states has been primarily generated by white cis hetero christian rich men and that's they're not the only ones creating that information but the information that we decide that our society decided was valuable was worth archiving was worth saving up until very recently and still arguably we're having to fight for our for perspectives outside of those groups to be considered important mm -hmm. um, they're going to be the ones that are shaping the material that these uh, machines are training on but but maybe if the information is now created by machines that's not going to be any better no, because the machines are still being, there is no such thing as unbiased information, right? There right. is no such thing as a purely objective viewpoint on a piece of information, because those pieces of information and what we are making available to these machines are ultimately chosen by people and people have biases. So one of the fun facts of this new age is called model collapse mm. and what it is is that at a certain point a chat gpt like system has spent so much time taking in so much information from the internet that it starts to get stupider now that's kind of like humans right if you spent your whole day learning about your disease on the internet you'd probably get a lot stupider by the end of the day you know 
And, and so now people are saying, well, maybe these models need to be a lot smaller. Like if we want to model on microbiology, we should just put all the microbiology textbooks into the model and let it then learn from that. But this idea that we'll, we'll just read everything on the internet and we'll get smarter is obviously not true. If you did that, you'd get stupider too, you know? So, I mean, I, I think there's, a lot of this is hype, right? Everyone wants to attach AI to their company and think their stock price will go up 20%. What do you think was the equivalent, uh, you know, the equivalent thing that companies want to do attach their names to say 25 years ago? dot com oh god right pets dot com okay that's gonna be a winner flake right? dot com was right. a portal for breakfast <laughs> right. cereal wait are yeah. you kidding was that really a thing that was real <laughs> oh lord that was real yeah everything had to be we're gonna get on the internet and it will be a magical money right. fountain right right yeah. exactly yeah no look i mean the problem is the four people i write about in my book they want to replace nature with a machine. You know, that's just the, the bottom line. And they want to do things like go to Mars for no possible reason other than we should be a multi-planet species. Or make you wear a virtual reality helmet for eight hours a day, even in your office. So you have all your meetings in virtual reality. or live to 200 by going down to San Diego like Peter Thiel does and getting blood transfusions from 15 year old boys, you know, because the rats in his lab, Methuselah, the old rats that got transfusions from young rats lived a little longer than the old rats that didn't get. So he figures it'll work for him too, you know. I mean, all of these ideas are nutty. Mark Andreessen, he wants to make killer robots. So his whole idea is that, well, the robot should have the ability to make the decision to shoot. No human involved, no guy in a trailer in Las Vegas controlling the drone. It's all going to be, I'm going to make it smart enough that it can make that decision to pull the trigger. How does that usually end for the humans? Badly. Ooh. In his early testing, the robot can't tell the difference between a man with a gun and a man with a broom at 100 yards. So that's not going to work out too well, right? No, I mean, you know, the, this is, uh, we'll, we'll call it the Skynet trope that we constantly see in science fiction. And this is the one that I think most people immediately think of now when they think about what happens with the rise of AI? What happens with the rise of AI as a lot of science fiction stories that have become very popular and mainstream will tell you is that AI, as AI's rise, humanity's, humanity's primacy becomes much more precarious. And then eventually the AI gets smart. And the first thing that the AI decides when it gets smart is that humans are terrible and need to be wiped off the mat you know wiped off the map because they, of course you know it's good, like why wouldn't they decide that humanity is terrible and that in order for them in order for ai to survive humanity has to go so then we come into conflict there's war there's all of this and in the end quote another science you know quote another fantasy science fiction there can be only one um but i think that what those narratives are telling us is not so much about what the inevitable future is, because it doesn't have to be. Um, but what it's really telling us is what we are anxious about now as people. Science fiction, even though it is supposed, it is mostly about looking forward, about imagining alternate worlds, about imagining what we can do with tech, it's still about people. It's still written by people and it's written about things that reflect what we are wrestling with now I and mean, when frankenstein was written there was a lot of that reflected anxiety over 
uh, the, over scientific discoveries and what it meant about the nature of humanity and what is the difference between human life and human created life, um, like, artif like artificial life. But I think when we look at these stories telling us that, of course, AI is going to think that humanity is terrible and want to get rid of us, what we're really saying is that we fear each other. We fear what humanity is. We fear what it is capable of. So, of course, we're going to come into conflict. And the idea that just makes me really like it's not that I don't think there is no point to it, but it's also not the only way that we can view humanity. It is not the only story about artificial intelligence and what is possible. Um, can, can, yeah. I, can I, I think you're onto something. Um, psychologists have this notion about locus of control. So the no, notion of locus of control is if you have an internal locus of control, you basically think you're in control of your life and your destiny and your future. But more and more people, and I especially believe in the social media age, have an external locus of control. They believe that somebody, someone else, hidden forces, other things are in control and they're not in control of their future. And maybe it's fate or maybe it's something else, but they don't feel in control of their future. So needless to say, they obviously turn to autocrats, dictators, people like that to, con you know, induce control. And maybe that's part of the problem. We don't think we're really in control. And so why not let the machine do it? I don't know if that is really the problem. That might be some of it, but for a lot of us, I mean, our lives are controlled by forces outside of our control. I am a, I am a brown woman in America, and there are definitely societal forces that have made certain pathways easier or harder for me in ways that I have no control over. I can strive as hard as I want. And, you know, I have I have lived a lot of my life as the Asian overachieving stereotype, and I, I have found time and again that that idea that you can find success in the United States by just achieving, achieving, achieving does not does not actually apply when you are looking at the different social layers um, and how that affects your ability to move through society. But I think also the thing is that when we talk about these anxieties that we have with AI, it's also about because we see how we treat each other. There are so many stories where AI decides that humanity is terrible because humanity has been has been abusing the AI, has been abusing AI tech. Right, like, oh, it's just a robot. Who cares if I kick it, right? Or it's just, it's just a program. I'm gonna bang the computer when it's not doing what I want it to. Um, and of course, you know, we know from experience what happens. You can only hit somebody so much before they decide that they've had enough, and it all turns and it all becomes this cycle of violence and retribution, right? Um, there was a, I, I cannot believe I'm actually able to pull this out as an example of what we can do differently, but I'm a big Star Trek fan. Um, it's, it is a thing that I've inherited, I inherited from my parents. Um, and one of my favorite programs right now is Star Trek Lower Decks, which has a storyline where one of the main characters, who is the engineer, and he's like very stereotypical engineer, is so excited about technology, really loves working on the ship, but he's also a really empathetic character. He's a good friend to his friends. He thinks about other people. So he creates a program called Badgie, which is supposed to kind of like help him with, you know, with sort of like figuring out tasks or figuring out uh, how to put together a different program if you want to be able to you know, create a more accurate uh, torpedo launch or something like that. But 
he br he brings in his friend uh tendy who's another ensign because she wants to learn how to spacewalk and he's like okay we'll use my program we'll use badgie and because badgie occasionally glitches and takes for, you know like sort of pauses and has a little freeze eventually at one point rutherford gets angry and you know kicks the uh kicks the program which is manifested in the hollow deck as like a little starfleet badge and goes like he's like oh god damn it you stupid glitch and and hits him and it's supposed to be like well it's not a program it's not a real person it's not supposed to have feelings lo and behold badgie becomes uh, sentient and actually gets a little upset um we're going to say murderously upset that uh he's been treated that way the resolution of this, though, is really interesting because after four seasons, there, Badgie is about to, to, to destroy the ship. Rutherford goes uh, and basically tries to give himself up. And while his friends expect that he's doing this as a ruse because he's got some sort of special AI killing program, um, what he actually does is he goes up to Badgie and he gives him a hug and he says, I'm sorry. I should, you know, I should have treated you better. I created you. I had a responsibility toward you. And maybe if I had treated you better, if I treated you with more respect instead of just a thing that was there to benefit me, maybe you wouldn't have been so hurt. Yeah. And, yeah. And I like that idea because I, I, when I was reading your book and you're talking about the idea of regenerative economy, the idea that we could instead replace our systems of economy with ones where we don't automatically look at everybody as a thing, as a resource to be extracted, right. exploited, and used up, and then move and then move on to the next, like we're a virus or we are some kind right. of parasite. So that could be different. No, I agree. I'm, look, I, I would I would love to kind of imagine. What if Sam Altman is really right? And then in 10 years, there's 40 million people out of work and there's universal basic income, right? So everybody gets paid a living wage to do whatever they want to do. What would we do with that? Would there be thousands more people coming to the Writers Museum to, to kind of learn a craft? Would there be thousands more people trying to make music and put it up on Spotify or YouTube? Would there be thousands more people trying to make art? I mean, I don't know what would happen. And maybe there would be a lot of bad art created, you know, but, but there might also be some young genius come out of that who, who didn't have to worry about getting enough money to live on and maybe resorted to crime to do that but would just could just try and find what it is that did it well you know I mean, there's I a lot to... of bad art for us to consume already i just rewatched jaws 4. <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to before oh, we get to oh. audience questions and i i want to encourage the folks who are watching online to type those into into your q a box um, so that we can include you in the discussion. But before we get to the, the I wanted to ask a little bit about the, the role of government and government regulation. When we talk about pushback to this, is that, and you know, President Biden recently issued an executive order, you know, claiming to control and, and curb the uses of AI, is this, is that a solution to some of the problems that we've been talking yeah. about? Okay, so there's three, pieces of legislation already beginning to move through Congress about this. So the first one is called No Section 230 for AI. So for those of you who are not tech geeks, Section 230 is the part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that says that no one can sue a social network for anything that's on the social network. In other words, Rupert Murdoch paid $730 million to Fox for defaming him about the voting machine company, right? For, there was far more defamatory information on Twitter than there was on Fox News, but you can't sue Twitter. So 
Senator Hawley and Senator Blumenthal have put forth a bill that says that anything that a chat GPT creates that's a total lie does not have that kind of immunity, like you can't sue it. So that's the first one. The second one is the AI Labeling Act of 2023, <clears throat> which says that AI companies have to label everything that they make so that you know that picture is a fake, was created by an AI, not a real picture, that you know that piece of content was created by an AI, not a real writer, that you know that piece of music was created by AI, not, you know, Weekend and, and uh, you know. Um, and then the third one is called the No Fakes Act of 2023, which is essentially says that you cannot create a fake of some person piece of music, a person without their permission. So you couldn't make a deep fake of Joe Biden falling down the stairs or something like that, which I promise you, you're going to see a bunch of those pretty soon. Um, so those at least are beginnings, right? As, as I said at the beginning, it seems to me that there's three things. One is transparency, what's in the model. Two, compensation, pay me when you take my work and put it into train your model. And third, an opt out. I don't want my stuff in your damn model, so you're not allowed to put it in it. And if you had those three things, um, that would be a start to me. Yeah, I would like, would you consider compensation accountability? Or would you consider accountability a additional uh key to making this all work well, like think, accountability I, I for think they all would make them accountable if they had to have report exactly what's in the model what went into it if they had to say hey for anything that was copyrighted that went into the model that would make them accountable okay yeah you no know? Let's take a few um, audience questions. I wanted to start with one that was online um, from Ruben, who notes the connection um, that you made with uh, anxiety expressed during, during early industrialization in Frankenstein. Do either of you find writers and artists today expressing analogous anxieties about the world and technology? Oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that it, it's the technology may change, but Part of what we do as writers and creatives is that we wrestle with the world around us, whether it's through literary fiction or through, uh, you know, th through not creative nonfiction or imagining other worlds. That is what we're doing is we're wrestling with this. Yeah. And tech is, tech is at the fore of everyone's mind right now um, for a lot of very obvious reasons. But um, it's also, I see more writers really starting to think about not just what tech means for writing as a craft, but for what it means for writing as a business. What do we need to know about our rights uh, to our work? What do we need to know about copyright? What do we need to know about uh, legal practices and standards for all of these things? Um, one, of, uh, one of the things that I wish more writing programs did was give writing students really good up-to-date information about the business of writing how to read your contracts what to look for because while it's great to have an agent who will help you with those things the more literate you are about business and i mean those tropes about artists being like ah, i don't really care about business i don't really care it's 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 not about it's not about the money it's about the art every artist i know is extremely business savvy right now right. because they have, have to, be. to be yeah yeah you have to be yeah do we have any questions from the room go ahead sir i hope i can tie my thoughts together because i have different thoughts as the talk proceeded i 
I happen to be a scientist, and and I and I think that STEM is a good thing. But I think when you talk about states like Mississippi getting rid of humanities and becoming a trade school, they're becoming like a chat GTP engine for science. They're taking a database of existing knowledge and applying it over and over again. So I, I think there's there's a there's so there, there's a it's more than just creative writing or STEM, it's creative thought in whatever field. Right. You talk about the influence of social media, to me it's, it's a misnomer, it should be called socialist media. And that, it should be benefits of that media, it should be distributed throughout society, not to particular individuals, but of course in the United States, in a capitalist society, right. Mm -hmm. We we can't stand the thought or it would be political suicide. So just to yeah, yeah, but just to, to get to the, the core for the folks that are listening online, I just want to make sure yeah, that they can you know, hear you also. You, you know what you said, I think is maybe maybe the most important thing that's been said tonight, which is this. These programs can only repeat or remix what's already been done. But great scientific breakthroughs come from original thought, from something that hasn't been done before. In the same way that great creative writing comes from that. I mean, you can put into, say, to ChatGPT, write me a Stephen King novel, and it, it'll take a remix of all the Stephen King novels and give you, but it won't be original. And, and there will never be a, you know, I, I was young, I worked for Bob Dylan. There will never be a like a Rolling Stone written by a chat GPT. It's just incapable of doing something completely original, which is partially why a company like Marvel, which makes formula movies, would love chat GPT, because all they want is another formula screenplay, right? I mean, they're happy making formula movies. Yeah, so, I think that was something that uh, was brought up was that uh, originality is not in the model for right. the for these programs and, and it's just as important for science as it is for the humanity right yeah. and ultimately look i i believe the the greatest use of artificial intelligence will be in science in and but it won't be in the way that people are thinking about it now it'll be helping design new drugs or something you know but it won't and and of course Whenever I think about the ability of, of scientists to use artificial intelligence to design stuff that's good for humanity, I also realize that it could design stuff that's really bad for humanity, right? You could design a toxic chemical, you know. Yeah, I think no. the point that we were, I think that we've all sort of been dancing around, I was trying to figure out the word for it, but uh, and I finally got it. It is we are we are also looking at how do we avoid the homogenization of creativity? How do we avoid the homogenization of innovation, whether it's in whether it's in tech or the humanities or pretty much any kind of daily living like creativity is an essential part of the human experience, no matter where your passions and expertise lie. But because these programs can only regenerate what has already been done, it's going to end up in for, reinforcing very specific boundaries where nothing right. new comes out of that and right. it becomes very samey. And if we're gonna like overlay that with a lot of the social issues that we look at, what is the dom you know, who are the dominant perspectives? What are the dominant ideas about what we should be doing, how we should think that is going to influence this homogenization. We've got a, a number of questions that um, that I think we're we're getting toward that, which is, you know, if I can summarize a few folks online who are asking, you know, basically what can we do as consumers of creativity to sort of make sure that we're doing so ethically and that we're not unwittingly furthering 
the misuse of these tools. Resist. So do what the Writers Guild did. Do what the Actress Guild did. Try and in your own work, figure out, do what the Authors Guild is trying to do. Try and make it possible for creative artists to continue to earn a living. And that means not allow these gigantic corporations to just take creative work and, and reuse it for profit yeah. without compensation. I think the, the, the writer strikes, the writers and actor strikes, a great example because for those who are in those fields, joining, uh, joining a guild, joining an organization that will allow you to participate in collective action because the corporations and the powers that be that you go up against when you right. resist are very, very big and powerful. Individuals, it's much harder to do things, but if you get together in a collective, that is really, really helpful. Right. But if you are someone who is outside of those fields but <clears throat> wants to support them, the things that you can do, uh, writers and artists and, all, and anyone else who is looking at how they can be affected by this, they've talked about what is helpful. Um, you know, buy, you know, buy original work, buy work that you know is original. Um, make sure that you are pressuring your elected representatives to support legislation that is supportive of creatives and not unfettered access to information and unregulated technological development. Um, you can also just don't be entitled. I mean, I think that was a big thing that we saw with the writer's strike and the actor's strike was that you had audiences who are very, very used to getting a steady stream of entertainment and a steady stream of right. content who actually were, who actually mostly were saying, hey, if they're not get, if the writers aren't getting paid, if the actors aren't getting paid, and these, the majority of these writers and actors are not, they're not Tom Cruise, they're not Stephen King, they're not right. ridiculously wealthy. They're people who are living literally paycheck yeah. to paycheck. Class. We will, like, we're, we don't want our entertainment to come at their expense. Right. So we are going to support them. No, the, the, the unions got unbelievable public support for those yeah. actions. Um, I've got a couple other things. Quit Twitter. That's a simple one you can do. It, you know, I was in Boston three weeks ago and I was on a panel with the head of NPR's social media system. And she said to me, well, Elon Musk said that we were state media, you know, like we were a mouthpiece, that NPR was a mouthpiece for Joe Biden. So we quit Twitter. And, and the day that we decided to do it, the young people in my group were freaking out. They said, oh, our traffic is gonna drop like a stone. It dropped two tenths of 1%. They went off Twitter and she said, when I think about the amount of hours that we spent every week trying to push stuff onto Twitter, hype our thing it, it's just all of a sudden like we had we had so much more time we couldn't believe how wonderful it was yeah, you know didn't the place playstation just said that they're dropping access to twitter from their uh yeah. in incoming models you know i have a funny personal experience i took my daughter and her husband and three grandchildren to africa last summer and we went to Tanzania and we landed in this camp and in the first two hours, the three grandchildren who were 16, 13 and 10 were freaking out. There's nothing on my phone. I can't, I can't there's no messages. There's a, what happened? And th there was not only no cell service, there was no Wi-Fi, there was nothing. And, and for about, Three hours, they were just like in anxiety. And then I said to them all, I said, you might as well just put, turn your phones off and put them in your luggage because there will be nothing for the next 14 days. 
And then, like that, it changed. And their parents were saying to me by the third day, what has happened to these kids? They're paying attention. They're talking at dinner. They're, you know, they're, they're looking at the you know, animals. And it was like such a thing that now they have a, they have a digital Sabbath that the family does every Sunday. So the they idea that you can't, the idea that you away. can unplug from some yeah, of these you, things you and that can, you can you consume, can, you can be ethical nonsense. about what you, you know, it's like what you were saying, Michi, about, you know, making sure that you're consuming original work, that you're right. supporting creators who are doing, you know, who are doing their own work, I think is really important. Right. We're, we're just about out of time, but we have time for one more question. If you want to ask your question, I can repeat it up here so the folks can hear online. Okay, so the, the question was, what do, what do the panelists see as the next big milestone in the space? Ooh, this is a big one. Um, you know, I actually really like the idea of having these tools that make things easier for writers, particularly I, I deal with, uh, I live with depression and, uh, you know, sort of some cognitive uh, issues because of complex PTSD. And some of these tools, uh, like uh, there's a online tool, it's uh, op currently uses OpenAI, but they are looking for, alt for a more, <laughs> ethical source, uh, but it's called Goblin Tools. And one of the things that they have is a translation for text where it's, let's say you, I have to actually ask somebody to please, for the love of God, pay my invoice. Pay my invoice, I am a freelancer, I depend on a steady, it, I need a steady income, and this person hasn't paid the invoice. So I don't have the bandwidth to try to figure out how to say this politely. So I will just type it angrily like, for the love of God, pay me, pay me now. And then you you tell it, oh, I want you to give me something that give me text that is polite, but you know, polite but stern. <laughs> and it will translate the text for you. You don't have to. I'm use signing it up for this right now. It is <laughs> really <laughs> I need this. But you know, those those kinds of tools. I think that the next big thing is if it is done ethically that that is the underlying assumption right is that this is going to be done ethically and non as non exploitively as possible is that we will have tools that will allow writers to focus more on the creativity of writing not the little nitpicking things like making sure that everything is cop you know everything is copy edited i've got it through spell check I don't have anything redundant um, in my text because, as we all know, when we're reading things over, and I'm sure you've experienced this, your eyes will just skip right over something because it's you're seeing it the way that it is in your head, not the way it is on the page. But ideally, what I would really love to see this do is push us to reconceptualize how we view each other, how we view creativity as a form of labor, and one that should be, that deserves respectful treatment as a resource, uh, as, uh, you know, as not just productivity and, and means for profit, but how do we create the things that we want to create and be supported when we need time to recover, to regenerate? Yeah. from the amount of energy and work that it takes to make these things. Look, my, my problem is that, that the current social media tools, and I think AI will make it worse, is allowing people to battle online, to just be engaged in combat. And Margaret Mead once gave a class, and, and she was asked by a student, what was the first sign of civilization and the student thought she would say of oh, some cup you know in, in africa or something you know some crude tool and she said um it was a broken femur that had healed and she said because if you're an animal 80,000 years ago, and you break your leg, 
you're dead, right? You can't get to the river. The fucking lion's going to come and eat you. You're gone, right? So somebody obviously picked up this human, carried him to safety, and nursed that person until the point that their leg was healed. And that was the first sign of civilization. In other words, when we cooperate and help each other, civilization grows. And, you know, right now, we're devolving. We're going the wrong way. We live in an incredibly nihilistic culture. Think about the movies or the TV shows that you've watched for the last 20 years. Sopranos, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, Succession. What are they about? They're all about really horrible people struggling against other horrible people for power. Nihilistic. So is it any surprise and after 15 years of that, the, the Sopranos was in 2000, people say, well, maybe Tony Soprano should be president. And, and that's what we got, you know? In Game of Thrones had dragons going for it. Though. <laughs> uh, no, that, that. no, 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 not enough. I, no, that is not, uh, sadly, it was not enough. <laughs> not there enough. were not enough dragons in that. <laughs> uh, I like my counterpoint to those would be like, we also have shows like uh, Leverage and um, The Fall of the House of Usher, which was absolutely about comeuppance. Um, but we also have narratives that tell us that you know, it doesn't always have to be this nihilistic sort of, you know, the the powerful eat the powerful and that's right. how it is. The stories that we have, if we find ourselves, we can choose to read stories also that are about connectivity, that are about collective and cooperative work, right. that are about how we can create <clears throat> a respectful, non-exploitive society where we can actually, where a tool like AI, we don't have to worry about what happens when it becomes smart, because we will already be treating each other and the world around us in a way that is not designed to hurt, that is not designed to abuse. So if an AI becomes, you know, becomes sentient, and when they do, we're going to have a whole different set of problems than the ones that we're talking about. But at least we're not going to have to worry about its first decision being one of defensiveness and seeing humanity as a threat. If we are not a threat to each other, if we are not a threat to the world we live in, that makes that it is less likely that something that develops consciousness down the line, I would like to think that it will happen. Let's hope. We'll actually look at it. How can I cooperate and become part of this world? And I think that's a, a lovely note to, to leave this on. I want to thank both of you for this incredibly nice. thought-provoking discussion. I want to thank everybody who came out tonight. Thank you.